All right, everyone, I want to call the meeting to order now. Um, welcome, everybody. This is our first meeting in a very long time with residents in the room. 20 or so people here, others online. Thank you very much. Um, COVID is a new reality. We do not have a desire to shut down again. It's happened. Let's move on with life. We will have some bugs. We will work out the bugs. That will be OK. We'll have a hybrid model going forward with teams that have both virtual and in person. So that is very much the goal. And we'll start thing more to radically change um, with COVID in the state of Florida. Um, so I'm not expecting that. With that, we'll start with owners' comments. But I also want to remind everybody that when we talk about a specific topic that is on the agenda, we welcome owners' comments during that topic too. It will have a specific period when we're just done discussing it and we'll ask for owners' comments. So um, if you appear for a specific topic on the agenda, you can wait till we discuss that item. If you've got other items you would like to discuss and you're in the room, please raise your hand or online, raise your hand online and we'll be happy to take owners' comments. I put a sheet on next to you. There is one owner who signed in who would like to speak. I am Penny. Yeah. That, come on up and join us. And owners' I, comments are for three minutes, please. And I'm going to ask, since we're in a room without amplification, for those of us who are sitting here in the room, uh, particularly for those of you who are wearing masks, which is great, you're going to have to really speak up because I'm old and I can't hear. <laughs> Please, it's right here. I'm fully vaccinated and boosted, so I'll take a chance with this crowd. <laughs> okay, um, I have one page. I have about seven pages all together that I sent as an email, and I apologize, it wasn't an attachment. I was having trouble. I put it in the body of the email. Um, I'm just going to read the first page to you. Uh, it's regarding the tennis facilities in our community. Um, we have limited space, and I'd like to also discuss appropriate usage and accountability. Uh, I'm going to talk about Vantage Tennis, which is the contractor or the vendor, the vendor in uh, the situation that I'm going to discuss. Uh, there's too many pros. There's rumored to be 10 working on their community tennis courts. Have you seen all the background checks on these pros as required by the signed contract? Darren Hope has monopolized our tennis courts and is essentially running a tennis academy on our limited resources. This strain on our facilities is unnecessary since there is the largest tennis center in the world only 15 miles away, the USTA National Campus at Lake Noma. Many of Advantage Tennis clients are non-residents. Why is Advantage Tennis allowed to give lessons to people, most likely tourists, that don't pay our HOA dues? Why is this being allowed during a pandemic? This is happening more than you or Park and Recreation realize. Did you know that Darren Holt advertises himself on his website and the internet as the tennis management company for the town of Celebration? The allocation of courts is a problem. Advantage Tennis often reserves the newest courts, a majority of three of, out of five of our limited amenity at the best times of the day for lessons. In January 2022, Advantage Tennis has reserved nearly 500 hours of court time, I've been told. This is vendor creep, and it is not fair to HOA dues paying residents who can't play at all, or who are forced to play at the worst time of the day. That would be between noon to 4 p.m. As you know, high heat humidity. Except for now, right now, this <laughs> current. <laughs> All right. Um, did you know that as a HOA dues paying celebration resident, I can't reserve a tennis court? The celebration website states online reservations unavailable. We need a reservation system put in place. I've called to report frequently that uh, contract variations by Advantage Tennis, for example, in the signed contract, he's limited to one court, one pro. Frequently, there's two or more courts, often with one pro on each, giving private lessons. Accountability is needed for what is going on on the tennis courts. If you have ever been kicked off a tennis court, I have quite recently, and it's in the detailed report that I emailed to you. 
uh, so that a lesson can be given, at least I thought there was financial compensation being paid to Croy. Have you read the contract? As I read it, this is my interpretation, Advantage Tennis should be paying us rent for using the tennis courts for instruction. Out of the tuition, he charges for classes, which should include children, private, semi-private, mini clinics, and group. Your vote of Advantage Tennis is to pay us 20%. I have looked at the financials and the numbers for rent and the 20% 20% tuition advantage tenants should be paying don't add up. According to the signed contract, Pro can request the financial records from advantage tenants for the past four years. Please look into this alarming situation. What is the purpose of the partner program if the contracts are not enforced and the money not collected? The money that is collected should be allocated into a fund to expand the number of tennis courts in celebration. We have another 1,000 homes coming to celebration and no new tennis courts. If Vantage Tennis is allowed to continue under new rules and regulations, there will be a need for much more supervision from Grand Dam. Residency needs to be checked. Payment for court reservations, the rent, and tuition 20% must be paid to close. There has been in place an honor system. That's not adequate. There has been minimal oversight. And let's talk about security. We're close to our three minutes. I'm right. sorry. We need new fencing to secure a tennis courts from outsiders. Are the cameras functioning? Reestablish the tennis advisory committee. This is a suggestion. We'll assist in drafting and rewriting a new contract. And please look into the financials and get back to me again. The numbers just don't add up. Okay. What I will say in response is that we have extended their contract for two months to sort this out. Certainly the Recreation Committee, of which I know there's some members in here tonight, need to look at it hard. But board, we've asked Lauren to get heavily involved in the board and we'll look at what's going on. Normally, being very honest, renewals get done and the board is on the periphery. The board will not be on the periphery of tennis renewal. I would like to thank the board is volunteering for serving us, are serving our community. And I'd also like to thank Nikki Patton, Director of Product and Recreation. She has been very transparent and helpful in my investigation. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate Thanks. you saying that too. Other resident comments? No, any other resident comments in the room or online? Again, when we talk later on a particular topic, you'll be able to do it. OK, so no other owners comments. Can I verify that the meeting was properly uh, noticed? Yes, it was noticed at least 48 hours in advance per the Florida statute. And can I verify what we have formed? The answer is we've got yes, Cindy David and Jackson and me here. I see David. I believe Celia is online and maybe Kevin. Celia, are you online? She said she wasn't. She told me she wasn't going to. Uh, okay, maybe she's done. Okay, and um, do we see Kevin anywhere? I'm definitely online. Okay, De David's definitely there. Okay, good. Um, okay, so we, I think we got four people. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands under God, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. With that, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? So moved. Can I have a second? I'll second. Any conversation on the agenda? David, if you don't yell and shout, we're going to assume you're happy. I'm um, happy. I'm happy. <laughs> and, warm, right. and warm. So the motion is adopted. <laughs> okay, approval of the minutes from the CROA board meeting of December 8, 2021. Since I see some new faces, the way we do minutes is after a board meeting happens. They're actually drafted and sent around for comments by the board right after the meeting is still happening and fresh in our mind. So this is 
more of a perfunctory exercise. Can I have a motion to um, adopt minutes? So moved. Second. Said I will. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be on the ball. Okay, well, any comments the on the minutes? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we had an email. Let me make a comment about minutes in that. And um, Lauren and I have traded some emails and stuff like that. We went through this wonderful transition online. You should be able to find agendas. You should be able to more easily find minutes and stuff like that. As we're going through fixing many different things, we are going to fix that so that it is easier to find meeting minutes, meeting agendas and stuff like that. We'll make that a priority. The honest truth is with the transition from CCMC, it wasn't a few balls that got dropped. It was every ball that got dropped. So, you know, we're picking them all, put them back together. We need to fix that. So I want to acknowledge publicly, we know we need to fix it and we will. And when you say meetings, are you talking about just Chrome meetings or? Well, we're recording meetings like the Recreation Committee, special events and stuff like that. We had said that for a period of time, those would be available online and people should be able to see it. We should be able to see the minutes from those, I think. We need to figure out, at some point we need to make this magic transition from, is it on our website or should it be on the portal? But we need it so people can see all these things. And the agendas. And, and, and the agendas and the business of the community. I think it is a fair request from any resident to say, I want to see the business of the community. So, so Brian. Brian, Go ahead, David. Yeah, yeah, this is David. Yeah, in, in that, I know, I know that there were earlier discussions about um, morphing many things that are for our residents from the website, which is universally available, to the portal. So this may be the opportunity where we, where like if you think about every committee, you know, there's a there's the meeting is noticed, there is the a, a publicized agenda, then afterwards there's minutes. Uh, many of them are recorded, so that could all be in one place, you know, September, October, November, December. I have never considered the website to be a great place for that. If we can put those on the right. portal and have somewhere organized on the portal that shows the board, finance committee, picture committee, and here are past agendas, here are past meetings, here are the videos. Video storage has always been an issue. You can't just store videos forever. It fills up everything for a period of time. But that's in Lawrence Court. <laughs> I actually had a conversation with Patrick about this today, and um, he is going to be developing a kind of a plan of action and timeline to transfer everything from the website onto the portal, so it'll be available for residents, um, as well as the call center to help them in answering mm -hmm. questions. So it's it's on our to do list. It's getting picked up right now. Okay. I think the committee members a list for each committee would also be helpful to people just so they know who these people are. And we used to have that. So. And, and, and I think we should, and for purposes of the minutes, Susanna, let's make sure that we're getting these items out there so we're, that we're not talking about them and losing them, but we're clearly getting them into minutes and we're going to have to have follow up some. Okay, good. All right. Um, anything minutes is passed, we'll go into the financial update. So we, we've, we've got Ariel, we've introduced Ariel to the community before. He's the finance manager for celebration working as part of Grand Manners. Um, I'll let him speak in a minute. And it, it really, we are still very much in a transition. And, and I, I really need to remind people when CMC learned they were losing account, this account was like July 2nd. Um, Grand Manners took over on November 1st. A lot of things may not have got perfectly done between July 2nd and November 1st, and there certainly has been um, just normal transition stuff. We were no longer CCMC's number one priority for obvious reasons, so we've spent a lot of time just trying to get through to year-end financials so that we could really start 2020 going forward on a stronger thing. So if you were to say to me, you used to be at the financials we're in here, my answer would be yes. Um, and they're not right now, my answer would be yes. And we're finishing that transition and want to get good year-end financials. So with that as background, what is the status, and I'll let you speak in any order you want, on November financials, the data transition from CCMC, and the anticipated timing of the December financials? The November financials should be done. You're going to have to speak up. Can't hear you at all. The, mass line. the November financials should be done by uh, January 20th. 
we should have the set of November financials ready for the board to review. So November financials by January 20th. Yes. OK, that's a full balance sheet. Does that include all service areas and everything? That includes all service areas. OK. The, the December financials will be the December financial will be ready by February 15th. February 15th? Yes. And that included the service areas as well. OK, so we're not going to have OK. Where do we stand with transition of data from CCMC? All transition that we needed from CCMC has been given to Grand Manors, and we are in the process of finalizing the last data that we have received to compile and finish the transition. So what is driving November to be done on January 20th? I mean, you know, just help, help the audience and the board and everybody else understand why it's taking as long as it's taking. And then what would that mean for future financial statements? Yes, we had uh, the balance, the owner balances uh, were in pretty bad shape when we received them. So it took us a lot of time to go back and forth cleaning the AR for the financial. That took a big chunk of our time. I would say the majority of our November time was uh, devoted to fixing AR balances for homeowners. OK, so then let me say what I think you just said. So that would mean if my house had a debit or a credit or anything like that, just getting the detail behind that was very cumbersome. Correct. And how and you're there now and you're comfortable. It's correct. Yes, we are comfortable with the information we have now. Um, but there's still some things that we're fixing, as, as we noticed with the no, uh, January 1 billing for the first quarter. So, uh, but all that has been worked out, and I, I feel comfortable that we'll have the financials ready for November 20th. And when we talk about account receivable oh, balance is working, if someone happens to live in Artisan Park and be in a, you know, a condo and have so the service area stuff for Artisan Park and also have CROA bills and stuff like that. The segregation of all the components is working. Yes. Okay. Thank you. If anyone in the audience or online feels differently, let us know. We're, we're trying. To get the facts. Um, OK, so then January 20th for November financials, which really means since we got a board meeting on the 26th, I'd love them to be able to talk about November at the January 26th um, meeting. That's the hint to the treasurer. And if we get the, on the 15th, I guess, for the year end, then we're going to have to talk about that towards the end of February. All right. Is it safe to say that we have a limited amount of data from CCMC historically? So in other words, what the transition meant was that you were pulling over these balances, these uh, account balances and making sure that we were getting the right billing out to residents, but we don't have historical data going back several years on these properties. That is correct. OK, so as we populate the new databases, there will be more information available to owners and to management about the status of properties going forward. In other words, we are we are populating going forward, but we're not spending time trying to go back and recover from CCMC data that would have been historical. That is correct. OK, and, and I think it's important that people understand that. It's just that's part of what transition is going to be here. In a perfect world, we would have gotten all of that data, but because we don't, we're trying to move forward and put our resources into getting the current information correct rather than going back and figuring out what happened two or three years ago to create a, a history. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget that what, what we had said was we were going to do a conversion at January 1 of 2022. We moved that forward by two months because it was obvious that was going to be a good idea. So, you, you know, Grand Manners has been off behind the ball here, accelerating by 60 days. I mean, Lauren's been started in the middle of November and then had to move and really got here full time the middle of December. So, you know, she's a veteran now darn near a whole month. So uh, and it's, it, these these things get lost in the conversation. So I I hear different things about what is the board doing? Well, the board is practicing patience because these are not easy. These are complicated 
the reason we had so darn many people, and there's a lot of people in this room and on this call, call who were involved in this decision, easily 40 people, 45 people sitting in the room when we interviewed all the people and made the decisions and stuff like that. But we fully well understood we had to go through a transition. We're just telling you that is still the truth and we're still there. And we always knew it was going to play on summit to the first quarter. We, we also have Don Gilray from Grand Manors raising his hand. Okay, Don, go ahead. Don? Sound check? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now, Don. Go ahead. All right, great. Um, I'll try to turn video on. The video was telling me only people, certain people can have video. Oh, me too. Okay. Um, I echo everything that that, uh, that uh, Ariel was saying. I just want to do a little bit of elaboration on that, uh, is that the, uh, uh, the timeline between the first set of financials is extended because simply the transition part, for most transition, trying to get the information correct, you get that first set anchored, uh, first set of financials correct, uh, it takes a little bit extra time. And you know, we've had a few uh, a few uh, FUBAR things happen with uh, different uh, service areas and master with trash and different uh, different uh, assignments of rules for the different uh, types of uh, assessments uh, to, and unwinding that. So there's been a few uh, hiccups, but we've we've uh, trying to get the the goal was to get a good, a good set of anchored financials from November and moving forward. The December fifth December financials. Uh, is in it's contractually a, a year in close is usually 45 days anyway so that's why he said february 15th was the was the contractual deadline we'll obviously try to beat that because that starts into uh, your january close and uh going after after january the uh the financials will be due on the 20th so you get the 20 you, you, so going forward the the goal is to have the previous month's financials complete by the 20th and that includes and we, we can do the surface areas because they're set up as separate entities in Serenet, the service areas can be done independently of CROA, so we can we can get uh, have a timeline and instead of having trying to do all uh, data dump at once uh, to get these uh, all the service areas complete and CROA, CCS, and, and CJC and Kanoa all completed by the 20th. I just want to put that out there that there is a plan and we do have a goal. We do have expectations that are uh, seem higher than what they than what they are right now because of the uh, first set of finances seeming like they're going to be two months late. And, and they are and not too much like one month late, but um, that's just uh, uh, some some narrative on on the why. So which month? Do you, can, you, can you explain to everybody who Don is? Don Gilray is for Grand Manners, head of their finance and accounting group. So, so we're getting corporate support. It's not just the people here in the room, but we're getting help from Grand Manners corporate <laughs> on accounting as well. And Don is someone that spent time here in celebration during the transition process and knows our, as you can tell, knows our workings pretty well. There are several people from Plano that are helping. Don, what month did you say you were going to have, try to have delivered by the 20th? Was it January or February? Uh, starting, it'll be January. Uh, January's financial will be a regular month in close. So that, that's the uh, the goal there for, for month in close will be the 20th of the following month. So 20, for February 20th will be January financials. Okay, so we're going to get on February 15th, we're going to get year end, but on February 20th, we're going to get January. Right, and that's why we, we think the goal of the, the date, the, the contractual date for year end is February 15th, but we'll try to beat that to give us more time to do the January. Otherwise, we're really on a put ourselves on a timetable there. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other comments up here at the, on the dais about the financials? All right. Yeah. Uh, or in this world, what do you want to do? How do we? He can, he can be heard out there, right? You can be heard, but you want I'll to try. Testimony. Gary, how's that? To be seen, he's got to be seen here. To be seen, you yeah, got to be, be seen, seen up here. Okay. Okay. So, we're, David, we're learning the team's world. Yeah. Gary Hutzbeth, 1471 Resolute Street. Uh, the transition occurred at the end of the year when we were still had contracts in place with certain vendors and service areas had construction projects that were ongoing as well as starting. So my question is, are we good for accounts payable or is that gonna come back and, uh, and bite us later? No, all accounts payable are current. We have worked uh, with the transition of the invoices and the addresses, change of addresses. You know, corporate office have been working diligently in changing all the addresses for the vendors and we have done that. Yeah. 
Thank you. All right. Any last items on the financials? Thank you. Let's go to transition and management update. This will be you, Lauren. Uh, we have staffing. We want to talk about call center training and responsiveness and completeness of the online course. So, Lauren. Okay, so I'll start with staffing. Um, Town Hall should be staffed with 29 full-time employees and seven part-time employees. That's what our staffing levels are. Um, in November, we were down 13 to 16 positions. And since then, we have been working to backfill those positions. Um, currently, we are still looking for a resident services coordinator. So that's one of the, our individuals up at the front desk that answers phone calls and helps people when they walk in. Our maintenance lead, a maintenance tech, and three part-time park monitors. So we are, we're working to review applications as they come in, uh, but we are still short staffed at this point. And what I will add on staffing is one of the realities of the changeover is some people were here from the old days and they have decided to leave since. I mean, the reality of a changeover is some people love the change and some people say, well, this isn't what I was expecting and I've been interviewing and that's okay. My, what I had specifically told Grant Manners and specifically told Lauren is get it figured out by, by the time I'm done being president, which is March 2nd, so that we actually get headcount where it should be. We're down a couple of positions. Everybody here knows the reality of the hiring market and stuff like that, and, but we're making very good progress there. I think that's a true statement. Do you agree? Yes, especially with the, the positions that we've lost it, since November 1st of people uh, giving their notice, uh, we've been able to extend offers for both a service area manager and a community standards manager. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, the service area manager to start and the com community standards manager is going through the grand manners uh, hiring process still. And I, I would like to say that the grand manners name has been attractive. People have wanted to work for grand manners. Um, we've clearly said, Let's not save a dollar and keep positions open for three years. Let's just get what we got to do to reflect the reality of the community. Uh, I will tell you, we had a budget for 2022. I was given a spreadsheet by Lauren about a week ago. We're different than budget by $7,000 for salaries. So we have not sat here and said we have a salary and we've blown them through the roof by 40%. $7,000 on our salary budget really is a rounding error. So we are finding people who want to work here. The Grand Manor's name works. Lauren and Susanna and others have done an outstanding job. It is moving forward. We're, we're trying to just have this open conversation. All right, call center. I've heard things about that. Yes, call center. I have a happy update on that today. I actually had a face-to-face -face, uh, Zoom meeting with the kind of deputy manager of the call center yesterday. Uh, we discussed some issues that we were having in our communication with them and their understanding of how our back office works. Uh, poor Susanna was getting over 20 calls a day forwarded to her from the call center, which she just can't handle because, one, she's not at her desk 24-7, and that, two, that's a lot of calls to, to get through and do whatever else you had planned for the day. Uh, so we've righted that wrong moving forward uh, so we have a triage system within the office now that the call center understands so that should help getting residents to the correct person and in a more timely manner i also talked to him about the information that they have from us about celebration and the training of their staff um, they were given information about celebration in kind of a pdf format and a hard copy format that's not how most of their staff is used to working they're used to pulling up the information in Serenet. So we will be working on populating more information into Serenet to help the, the call center have that information readily available to them. So when somebody's calling and say, hey, when's Pups, Pups and Pints? They can pull it up on our calendar and they'll be able to give them that answer instead of having to call us, ask, and then supply the answer. Uh, so that's on our end. We'll be supplying additional information and that will also kind of tie into the putting the board meeting minutes and the committee members and committee meetings up in the website and on the calendars as well. That will help the call center too. So 
we're making progress there and hopefully the as they start getting more familiar with celebration the uh the level of service will continue to improve okay so let me make a comment and then i'd love for the other three board members to follow up on my comment it is the two finalists both had call centers we intentionally went with companies that had call centers in the world of ccmc the phone was not getting answered at all um and we are aware of that in spades uh, we are a growing community there's too darn many calls coming in that business model just did not work we watched it jackson and i specifically and then cindy and i had another one for each of the finalists that the call center can work are we working out bugs yes we're working out bugs we hear that there are issues and we do understand there are issues. Laura and I have discussed it many times. We have escalated the issues all the way to Stacel Teitelman and Amber Orduno for a couple of the big weeks at Grand Manor. So we are making that well known. On the other hand, we as a board, or I'll say it for Brian Kinsel, and I want the other three to speak, we are not going to change the model. We need, we'll make the model better, we'll enhance the model. But if we sat here as a community and said we want somebody at town hall to answer all these phone calls, we'll end up needing to hire two or three more people. That is by the time you factor in salary, benefits, and everything else, another hundred and hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Every forty thousand dollars is another ten home ten dollars on your homeowners association for fees. So we'd be sitting here saying we want to raise everybody's fees by thirty dollars just to have somebody answer the phone. It is not the most exciting job in the entire world. You train somebody, they leave, they want to get promoted, they go elsewhere. So we have a business model here. We're committed to the business model. We understand it's not working perfectly. We want to get it to where it needs to be, but that is, it was intentional. And again, we had a lot of people in the community who were involved helping us make this decision. We'll just got to get it there, but I want to hear, I hope David didn't get lost. And we got Jackson and Cindy. Cindy, do you have any comments? Oh, excuse me. I guess I have a question that I've seen pop up on social media. A lot of the residents seem to object to the phone being answered Grand Manners, as they call it. Now, is that that's typical throughout Grand Manners when anybody comes to the call center? So it's going into one big call center. So anybody in any of their communities could be calling this call center. So when a representative picks up the phone, they're saying Grand Manners because it could be somebody in a community in Texas. It could be in one of their other Florida communities. It could be coming from any of the other states that they uh, are providing services to. So getting a celebration specific cue doesn't really work in the grand business model. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and then I was also wondering, so do I understand you correct? Well, I understand what you said about the uh, people that call center have everything in hard copy or PDF. And that would be hard to find answers to even the basic questions. So once all this information is put into the fair net thing, then they'll be able to access that. That has to do that. So yes, that's it's part of their standard business process. So when other communities call in. They have access to the to specific areas of where they know information is about amenities, about what's happening in the community, events, you know, payments, who, when is trash day, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's on us now. We need to be populating more information. There's some basic information that's already populated, but we need to be adding more to make their lives easier so they can help the residents. That's yeah, you're still short staffed. <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> well, I was also going to say yeah. part of it is teaching homeowners how to find the information, Sierra. Because if anybody, you know, when you've been on there, there's a lot of different routes to get there, and there's so many different tabs. And so, you know, we're still learning as management how to find certain things. So I think part of that is educating residents when you have, when you're looking for this kind of information, this is where you go. Just click here, click here, and there's the information. So that's part of us evolving too. Is knowing where to find it and how to communicate to others where to find it. Are you, gonna, are you planning any face-to-face -face training sessions for people or are you just going to hope that they, you know, it's, yes, we are planning to establish some additional training for residents. Um, we are, we finally have scheduled additional training for our staff uh, from corporate that's tailored specifically to celebration and the way we do business here. Um, so 
that's happening tentatively next week with additional ones to follow up with some other very specific questions. Um, so once that occurs, I'll schedule with our staff members that feel comfortable training and with in conjunction with grand manager staff. Okay. Yeah, I I understand the frustration. I also understand the frustration of calling and not having anyone pick up the phone and being on voicemail and not getting a call back. I I think that in the big scheme of things, whether they answer the phone grand manners or hi, good morning, doesn't make much of a difference. I really want my questions answered. That's the point. I think learning how to direct the calls back into town hall so that they're going to the right person for the right question is ultimately the path that we have to follow. When I visited the call center, I was struck that each operator had three screens in front of them and they were large screens and they were fully populated in their properties. And it really goes back to what I asked Ariel a few minutes ago. We don't have historical data into Grand Manors about celebration. We are building a database. And I understand that that seems crazy when you've lived here for 25 years, but they are just learning the community. And so every piece of information that they get gets added to the database. So when you call and ask a question, they are recording that and filling that into the database. So over time, it's going to get better and better and better. It's dynamic, not static. And some people would say, well, you should know everything right away on day one. That's great. I mean, I, it would be aspirational. But the reality is that what we're trying to do is within the, the model that we've got and the cost parameters that we've got to find a workable solution and then to continue to improve it. I think that when people complain about the call center, it's understandable, but I would ask that you show just a little bit of grace while we teach those folks how we operate here and what we need. And I've looked at the stats, most of the calls are getting resolved through the call center. I mean, the vast majority are, but I understand the ones that aren't are problematic and oftentimes involve people who like air their experience on social media repeatedly over and over. <laughs> and so perhaps we can just all take a breath and let them work on this. And when we revisit this in a month or two, I suspect we're gonna say it's getting better, but not perfect. And we can, we can keep moving toward it. David, guys? Yes, yes, uh, several, several things. Uh, first of all, Brian, I appreciate your framing it. Um, it, it, it. When I think about the call center, and, and again, one of the reasons we picked Grand Manners w w was that capability. But what we were looking for overall is that greater efficiency, greater quality, greater timeliness. So maybe the concern that is getting voiced by residents is really about change. You know, it's, so so we have so just that large picture. To me, that's what we're trying to get at. Um, second point is, Lauren, I really appreciate your comments and your your you know your your talking with uh, the folks with the call center and doing some adjustments. And that's also one of the reasons that we picked Grand Manners because we wanted that flexibility. We wanted that ability to pivot. Uh, we want to do things different and have the services more for our residents uh, than we've had in the past. Uh, Jackson alluded to uh, building the database. So we don't have that database and that wasn't existing with the prior vendor. And, and as a side point on that pivoting and flexibility uh, to Cindy's point, what I wonder about, and I, again, this is a technology question is, could calls from celebration go to a different number that gets tagged as celebration and so maybe the phone does get answered, you know, welcome to Celebration Town Hall, you know, by any of the many people in the call center. That's a techno, you know, you, you have a bunch of trunk lines coming in. Maybe that pops up kind of like a caller ID. This one's from Celebration, and that could be adapted for your other communities, too. Maybe you have different phone lines that, uh, but they all go into one feed. So that's a, I'm not going to push for that. I just again just a, a thought that could make it feel more personal regardless of where the call center is 
so so I, again, I, I think part of the issue is change is challenging for many. And our aim is we want technology to work for us and to be more efficient, more responsive, more timely, which is our ultimate aim and, and you know, the whole service orientation, which is what we're all seeking. Thank you. Lauren's been taking a lot of notes. Um, third item, completeness of the online portal, the whole experience there, Lauren, kind of what's. Yeah, it's not complete. And that's part of the, it kind of ties in with the call center issues and transferring data from the website to the portal. So everything's available in one spot for everybody. It will also address some of the back door issues that we have with the website and the number of plugins that we require to to keep it up and running. So it's, I just had a discussion today with Patrick on the timeline and creating a plan for moving stuff over. Obviously it's not all on him, but he's going to be, he's the one who's managing and running the website now so uh it's on the list we're aiming for kind of a set plan in february and then marching forward but in the meantime there will be information added to the portal moving forward that will also help with the call service one thing you might think about is you've said a lot of things today where you've talked to somebody and you've got a plan and somebody's working on something if we can somehow just have a section of the board back it just you know it doesn't exactly. have to be war beast, but here's one page on what we're actually doing with the portal, you know, and not paragraphs. It can be bullets, but, you know, here it is, kind of here's the timeline of what we're thinking about. So people can say at least it's not been lost. Yes. Okay. Anything else on the transition for now? Okay. Well, let's, we're going to go to. You have two comments. I'm not sure how you're handling those during the meeting. I would take them down. We've got two comments. Yes. Uh, one for Steve Northridge and the other Jim Hayes. Tim who? Tim Hayes. Okay, um, Tim or Steve Northridge, go first. Go ahead. Hi, you know, I just wanted to also back up what David was saying regarding uh, having an incoming call number that's specific to celebration. If it's an incoming call, most call centers operate across multiple different companies. And basically, once the number comes in, you can then populate the screen with uh, celebration specific information and also a welcome can be given. Uh, indicating celebration. So actually, that's very common call center practice. This is not out of the realm of, of requests. So that should be something that should be able to accomplish. The other thing related along the same lines, I think all email addresses and website addresses should use the celebration uh, domains. They shouldn't be using Sirenet. Uh, I understand you have to redirect potentially to Sirenet, but those things are redirect issues, not, for instance, something that has to be broadcast to the, to the individuals. Also, something I brought up previously was email addresses. The email addresses for board members, I, I don't believe is, is available yet on the on the celebration site. I think it'd be good to have all the board members addresses, uh, email addresses on there, as well as aliases for the board and also the uh, aliases for the subcommittees. So if you want to reach a subcommittee, you can just email, uh, you know, rec, rec committee or whatever that is and so forth. So those are my suggestions. Thank you. Steve, are you saying aliases? Yeah, Alias is like, yes. <laughs> like, oh. like rec right. committee would be sent to either a person that would basically moderate that email address or could be or you can set it up so it can be distributed to all the members of the, com of the committee. I think you'd probably want to have somebody on the committee moderate that, to be honest with you, but that's just a thought. Okay, thank you. Jim Hayes? Yes, um, this is about how many people are using the portal. Um, and we have a very, on the website, on your community governance, there's a great page about the portal, including very complete documentation and a video. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe we should put a link on the homepage to that and point residents to that from the very beginning so that they can start doing that. I don't know what our percentage of uh, total residents that have logged on to the portal are. Yeah, I don't either. Lauren doesn't either, okay? Noted. All right, if there are no other comments, we'll go to action item two, which is discussion on COVID and mask usage. Um, Lauren, let's start with what is Grand Manor's policy on mask and mask usage? Uh, Grand Manor's current <clears throat> policy, uh, 
that was just recently updated is all staff members must wear a face covering while in the office unless in a private office or a private cubicle. Or cubicle. Um, when you're getting up and walking around the office, having conversations, we all must wear a face mask. We must wear it in the building. As you can see, we're all wearing it. Um, if you are at your private office, you can remove it. Um, that's pretty much the gist of it. Okay. Hey, Grant Manor suggested that everybody in the building should have to wear a mask. And the board president said, hell no. Um, and and, I, and I'm so I'm going to open it up to some board discussion. And we also talked to Tom and, and, and I was playing politics here. I mean, we're in Florida. We're an open state. I, you know, to set here, you, you, you're going to argue about whether people should or should not wear a mask. And you can get any three people. You can get six of eight. We all know it. And you get somebody who decides they're not going to wear a mask and they just start screaming at people our employees and that has this at best to be high tension and at worst it could get violent or something like that why are we going to subject to that and so that is my opinion we did get tom and all that tom talk about florida law here in just one second and then we said we would discuss it here publicly but i can look around the room tonight some people got masks on some people don't have masks on i think either one is perfectly fine with me um but tom what is florida law uh, Florida law is pretty straightforward. Uh, you may have heard that uh, the legislature in the last session passed some restrictions on mask mandates and vaccination mandates. I'll just touch on mask mandates. Uh, for public entities like cities, counties, and states, there's restrictions on imposing mask mandates. Um, think government agencies. But for private companies, they can do what they want. Just like you can say no shirt, no shoes, no service. If you walk into a restaurant, you can say you have to wear a mask or you don't have to wear a mask. It's up to you. So Croa and Grand Manners are both free to decide how they want to do it um, based upon whatever preference you have for business operation. Okay, so we'll open it up for board comment. David, I know you always have comments. I, have, I, I definitely have comments and Brian, I respectfully strongly disagree with you um i know <laughs> no, no, no i know i know that's fine that's fine uh, so so with uh, the science continues to evolve and covid continues to morph and we know that and omicron is uh, playing havoc i am double masked not as i sit in my own room now but i am double masking now uh, i'm reading the latest public health science including today's announcements uh, um, from my own uh, public health and medical folks uh, about the nature of masks and the masks that many of us have been wearing over the last few months are just not effective. So we morph into N95. I'm at a conference now out of town and they're providing N95 masks for everybody. We must be masked here. I believe that we should fully mask uh, and, and that whether we have a policy or we strongly, strongly encourage masking, I think that that communicates respect to our town hall staff who are required to wear a mask and it also communicates respect to our neighbors. Uh, so, so there's evolution science and, and, and with, with that. And then the other piece, again, reading in the, the uh, public health information I was reading today, which I talked about six months ago and asked management to look in this three months ago is what are we doing for the ventilation systems? That is being called into question, um, again, in the scientific community, that's what we need to be updating. Uh, the room that, you know, in the, eight, the rooms in the 851 building, any of our indoor properties, we need to be looking at what we can do to maximize the filtration and Again, the other scientific uh, pieces that help keep that air pure that all of us are breathing. So my suggestion is that we strongly, strongly, whether we require it or that we strongly, strongly encourage it. I think that's the respectful thing to do for our staff and for our neighbors. Jackson, comments? Um, you know, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted, I'm trying to be careful, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's, uh, I'm pleased that we have 
human bodies in the room tonight, even though some of you are looking very unhappy. Um, I, I'm pleased that we have 25 people online. I think that's the world we're going to live in is some people in person, some people online, and it's a matter of personal choice. And I really believe that if someone feels uh, concerned that we continue to offer the online options and making it as convenient and workable as possible. Um, but I'm not, and I know this will shock those of you that know me to be a wild eyed liberal. I, I am not in favor of putting our employees in harm's way by insisting that every person that walks into town hall wears a mask. I, I would like to think that we're responsible humans and we can behave that way and people will make their own choices. So for now, I'm comfortable with the decision that we've made. I'm glad to open up these meetings and I respect the decisions that people make. And I certainly respect David's views on these. Um, uh, so no disrespect there to him or to the staff. And, and frankly, just so you know, before all of you walked in, many of us here on the board asked staff if they wanted us to wear masks for their protection. And I don't think anybody on the staff said, yeah, I absolutely want you to do it. But if somebody said, I really want you to do it, I would do it out of respect for them. So I, I think it's a fine line we have to walk. And I just think common sense is where we want to be. I agree with everything that uh, with, that Jackson said. Uh, just looking around, because my point's always been, you know, we can put enough chairs in here. You know, we don't have to create little pods. People will automatically gravitate to what where they're comfortable. So just looking around the room, you know, I see two people sitting next to each other, but I know that they're very good friends. So they don't have masks on. They're sitting next to each other. They're not worried about anything. Other folks are at least, you know, one seat from somebody if they don't know them. There's somebody who's sitting, a couple folks are sitting a little bit towards the back. You know, I think at, at this point, after all these months and months and months and months, people have a good feel for what makes them comfortable. You know, certainly nobody's forcing them to come here. Um, if they do feel more comfortable online, I think, you know, Jackson's absolutely right. This is something that you should always have for whatever reason. You know, maybe I'm just, you know, home recovering from surgery, but I'd like to go to a meeting. I can watch it. Um, I, I, I think we're... I, I like this, people being back, keeping, people being able to come and ask questions, people actually being able to see us better and see our expressions on our faces, and we can look at your expressions on your faces. And I just think that that for now, this is fine. So they better top mask up during certain topics so another higher depression. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Lauren, do you have a comment on behalf of management? No, I would just say that um, we gave the staff the opportunity to attend virtually if they want to, and I would continue to do so. So if they felt uncomfortable or didn't want to be here present, I'm offering them the opportunity to, to attend virtually. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I mean, and I joked earlier that I said, hell no. I mean, I did not want an arbitrary hand down. It has to be this way. I thought we had a meeting yesterday and we were at the town diner and there wasn't anyone wearing a mask. I, I mean, so I, 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 I don't like something that is 100% arbitrary where people go to restaurants and don't wear a mask and they go to this place and they don't wear a mask and we're going to make them wear a mask here. So I, I mean, I, I, I very much respect David's opinion. I've worked with him a long time and like him, but I, I think this one I vote for, you're an individual. I hope well, I believe in independence. I hope you're vaccinated and get your booster. I think it makes it, the odds of people getting Omicron are relatively high. And I think they, if you re, actually read the science, the way it's spreading, you know, it's not terribly severe, but it's reality. And if we're going to have the fourth strain and the fifth strain, and they keep getting weaker and weaker, and we've got to go on with our lives. And that's kind of what I believe. I don't disagree at all with David's. We right. should strongly encourage mask wearers. Yeah, and, 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 and what, what is going to happen is we are moving into the end. We, we believe that what's going to happen with uh, Omicron is we're going to move into the endemic stage. This is with us forever. This is with us. And, and then how do, how do we deal with that? And how do we be safe? How do we be smart? 
So, so, so let me summarize then. So I think what we're saying is grant matters is management employees. They've got their rules. We respect their rules and that's the way it is from a board perspective. We're not, we're strongly encouraging it and you're welcome to have signs that say that, but we're not requiring it from meetings. It is, you make your own choice um, and stuff like that. Everybody's comfortable with that. David, you're comfortable? I'm, I'm, comfortable with that. I'm, I'm, com I'm comfortable with that. Okay, thank you. Um, we needed to have that conversation in public, so hopefully you understand. Okay, so now we're going to go to ongoing projects. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about lawn sports design first, then we're going to talk about um, the engineering work on the Civic Corridor, and then we'll... Um, Talk about a minutes project. So let's start with lawn sports. Albert Riddle is here. Excellent. Good evening. Back here. Hey, Albert. Hi. So what I want to do here, we can call Albert has done the design, so we can call him up as we need to. And we've been talking about what we're going to do tonight. Is we're going to talk about pickleball. We're going to talk about soccer fields. We're going to talk about Okay, and that we've had both of these going on for a couple of years. We've had task force since the middle of last year. We've talked them to death, and now we've really hit the point where it's decision time. So, what I'd like to do first is talk about lawn sports. And what we're talking about here, and really, I don't like this picture, so let's just go forward. Um, let's go forward one more. Let's see if we can blow that one up there a little. We, and, and at some point, I'll let Albert speak here, but I'm trying to set the perspective here. So Heritage Hall, and the reason Heritage Hall was chosen is there's really a couple of three options. We don't think the Civic Corridor is an option. We just don't think there's enough room and there's enough competing projects out there. Um, certainly, you could have East Village could be an option, maybe North Village bit of option, Heritage Hall. Heritage Hall is in the middle. You've got a wonderful space there in the back. We have had the task force. Albert has been involved for a few months now. Dury's been involved as a member of the recreation. Dury Moyer is a member of the recreation committee. And luckily they were able to hide far enough behind pickleball that they could do it in peace and come up with a lot of good designs. <laughs> um, so the, the issue, so what, what I wanna try to achieve tonight is to let everybody understand the design one more time. We'll take any comments, but then I'm hoping to move this one to a board conversation where we pass a motion to have Albert work with the task force and that to get this ready to go out for bids so we can get actually get bids. Um, what you have up there, and there's no good way, this has got a big distance here, but the two green spots would be is if you had two croquet courts and You've also got at the bottom there, you can see the pool, you can see the building, you go in the back there, and I can't possibly read that from this distance. Um, what the heck are those things? Yes. The flex space or the. Oh, I mean, yeah, you've got right up there, but I can't possibly read from this. Distance. What do you think? Yeah, jump up here. Now. Absolutely. <laughs> Even do some pointing or whatever. Nice to meet you, everybody. I'm Albert Riddle, uh, landscape architect. Been tasked to um, come up with this is our original concept. Um, and what we're proposing here is we've got two long croquet, and these are dimensionally correct for competition. Um, but the concept here is to sort of divide this free open space. If you guys have been over here yourselves, you know. Yes, so if so, you don't mind. Absolutely. So um, currently what we have is kind of a free open space here. It's surrounded by an oak, uh, scrub oak buffer. And what we wanted to do here was try to maintain this sort of free open space feeling here. Add a couple small pavilion areas for picnickers and, you know, people who just want to hang out in the space but then introduce a little bit more of a formal feel to the organization for the lawn croquet. Um, and also adding a pavilion or two to uh, provide cover for people using the lawn croquet. So this is really trying to be 
a center of the community for people who want to use formal lawn sports. These two spaces on the side were set aside as flexible spaces. And what I see them as more sort of an artificial turf area that could be used for putting greens. Um, it could be used for um, bocce. cornhole. Yep, bocce, bocce. we've got the link here for bocce, uh, lawn bowling, if you will. But we still have the flexible space in the center. So the other element is this sort of meandering path. And I'm thinking this is a community center or community area rather to walk, get some exercise, take your dog. So what we're trying to do is use the buffer as an area for community walking, this for long croquet, and this area for community activities that aren't associated with long croquet. In a nutshell, that's the design concept for that space. And the, the purple areas, the three purple areas by the lawn croquet are pavilions, right? Right, exactly. And what we've done here is we've sort of aligned this axis with the existing architecture. And we're going to repeat that architecture on a smaller scale in the pavilions. So it feels like it's always been there. Like and we're place. going to have access from two side streets there. Yes. Um, now, with this concept, what we're trying to do is avoid the traffic that currently exists for the pool and sort of focus the, the whatever the traffic would be more on Begonia and Spring Park Loop. And also, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking the Montessori schools here, it may be an opportunity for them to maybe use that pavilion or use this space over here, kind of create a connection to the Montessori school also. Basically, everything from here back stays the same. So this is the pool, Heritage Hall. So that that remains. And then if I could add a couple of comments here, I have not been in the middle of this still yet, but she's out of town. But obviously, you've got the bathrooms there at Heritage Hall. You've got the water at Heritage Hall. Um, this is an all-age sporting area. The Montessori School in the summer could use parts of the play. They already use the playground and stuff like that. So it's really almost taking the playground type concept that you've got to the right of the pool there and just flowing it through the whole area. Right. Um, so it really becomes a multi-generational sporting type area. And this thing, geographically, it's kind of centered. And so you really have young kids, older people, you got everybody, dog walkers. And I mean, when you go over there during the day, you see kids kicking a soccer ball, you see people exercising, I mean, it's really multi-generational. So now, when we had briefly discussed this before, Jackson, one of your comments is, do we have one field or two? As I thought about this up here, you can see it's got two. If we said from a cost perspective that we wanted to get quotes on one field or two, we could take one of the side fields and just make it grass and say, we'll convert it over further at a point later in time if we want to make an economical decision. I think... Albert, you and I have never had this conversation, but I think the whole design still works if we just decide we want to have one you know, bigger grass area for bocce or something like that and have one croquet now and have the ability to add a second croquet two years down the road or something like that if we build it to have that capacity. Can, so the, I, can the design pricing be itemized in a way that forces course. that? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I just want to jump on that because uh, there is a secondary design development plan that it's not shown right now, but on that plan, this becomes sort of the primary viewing area, almost like a grandstand for the primary croquet lawn. <clears throat> and the idea would be you'd have a primary and a secondary lawn. Right. And so this pavilion is really associated with that side. And this would be a secondary one that could be viewed from either one of those pavilions. So what I really liked about this when I saw this is that I think it can be a great long term solution even if it gets built in two components over two years or something like that, if we decided to go down that path. Or at least that's my pitch to the board. Or is there fencing around the croquet? Easy for me to say. Yeah. Is there fencing around the croquet courts? Yes, and, and that's what we're working on now. It's the next level of detail. We actually are showing this area completely fenced. There are gates, and then the sort of the interstitial spaces here are garden spaces as the pathway moves around that space. And what we want to do is just kind of create an elegant layout surrounded by small garden spaces. And what operates the gates? Your ID card? Yeah, you'd need an ID card to enter the, the gates. But, but, but certainly to keep wild pigs, dogs, everything else off the 
um, turf. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and balls coming from other places. Um, how? What is the? What is the? Do you know what the? Your walking trail that goes around. Do you know what that is in yards or or whatever? Like linear feet? I don't, but I can. Easily well, because what I'm thinking is, over the years, many people have asked for like a running track. Yeah. You know, if you would change the surface of that, then, you know, people could run around in circles all day. If Absolutely. They wanted. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's kind of the idea of that circulation pattern. It's really to create a loop, right? And you can go around or you can go through. So, yeah. A lot of walkers I've noticed in this area. Quite a few. Um, can we talk a little bit about parking? Absolutely. What do you foresee there? So... What I foresee is that on busy days, Begonia Road will be stacked up on this side, considering this is the primary entrance, and you'd have some on Spring Park. But primarily, this would be the main parking for any of the any events for the long croquet. Otherwise, I think most people that come here find their own parking or walk to the park. Do we do we have the possibility of doing angled in parking there? I don't see that. No, okay. I don't see that. So it's, it's parallel parking on, on one side of the road. Unless we design parking on the on the property, and that's going to it's going to eat a big chunk away at that area. Um, how many parking spots do we have at Heritage in the the poolside parking lot? Do we know? Whatever goes down alongside the street. I can say there's not really a change. Yeah. There's a drop off. Just a drop off. Drop off parking lot, per se. There's handicap parking. There's yeah, but yeah. Uh, other than that, it's a drop off. Okay. Uh, can I, while you're thinking, can I ask another question? So, I believe that that turf that goes in there has uh, has to be maintained quite frequently. The long croquet? Uh huh. Yeah, I so, the, say, so the wickets yep. aren't permanent then, because then you'd have to be scaping a, a, around them. Well, no, I think the wickets can be moved. Yeah, they but, definitely. Well, but, I mean, but they stay there, <clears throat> and then they're removed when they, and then somebody has to put them back to where they were. Right, right. Yeah. So they'd be placed and then picked up. Right. The oh, no. So there's no storage. Let's get involved. let's get an answer from the people oh, who yeah. actually know. Yeah. I, I can address that. Uh, a few months ago, we played. Your name and address, please. Uh, pardon me? Name, name and address. Oh, that's right. Uh, ah. Dave Falls, 1105 Blaine Street. Um, we played croquet a couple months ago at a course on Gasparilla Island. And uh, I, I took a great deal of time looking at just how they manage the maintenance of there. Uh, the people who do this know exactly what they do. The guy rides by on his mower, he picks up the thing when he's going by on the left-hand side, he goes down there, he finishes, he comes down through there, and he puts it back in when he comes back out, out on the other side. It's uh, The guy did the entire court, and I would have guessed it might have added 15 seconds to the entire operation. So it's, uh, it's very easily done, the whole over there, and easy job. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and just to be clear, I know that um, you often see kids on the front of this park playing and families and others. Are we removing that space from them to be able to play? I mean, is there still open space in Heritage to? to yeah, that, I think that's an important component. Yeah, that's not going to be changed. OK, so this retains its community feel. Am I correct, Albert? That's sure. what you're trying to do is not impose something in the middle of a residential neighborhood, but you're trying to enhance the residential neighborhood well, and it's filled. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're really placing this delicately so that it still serves the immediate community, but also provides a place for water croquet. David Anderson, you have questions, comments? David, are you muted? No, no, yeah, no, I just was unmuting. Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the design. I like that. and. One of the comments is, as we start to price this out, what would be the difference, you know, one versus two? Uh, the, cement, the, the symmetry of it, uh, it really looks nice with two. A question of having two is, would we have the usage for two right away? Um, but uh, again, it may, not, it may be more cost efficient to go ahead and build both of them at once. 
again, that to be determined. But I, th I really okay, so like gonna, I, I really like how we're using the space. I'm going to ask Dave to speak to usage. Dave. Okay. Yeah, Dave Phillips, 1105 Blaine Street. Yeah, the, the usage, uh, if you haven't played croquet uh, outside of anything, outside of your backyard type of croquet when you were kids or, or, or whatever, uh, the most people who can play a croquet game at any given time, and that's if you're doubling the games, is eight people. Normally games are between two, two to four people, but if you double up, which can be done, you can play that. And so if you have a crowd, which is typical when uh, I think the Croquet Association uh, has uh, plays down some little tiny court, uh, it's not unusual for them to have 30 to 40 people there. So uh, a game takes 45 minutes to play and uh, uh, it would be a little bit difficult to uh, I guess what I'm saying is if I was to make that decision, I would have to agree with David that two courts seems to be the smart thing to do because you can get 16 people playing at one time. Uh, and it will also be much, much, much easier for us to do uh, uh, clinics for the kids in the summertime uh, in the, the summer project camp. that they do here mm -hmm. and uh, programs. Point. So, okay. and, and just to add to that, really one of the requirements we talked about is we would make this multi-generational with teaching and everything. Absolutely. And it's just a point to reinforce that, uh, Brian. Uh, uh, I just finished watching a, a croquet tournament not too long ago, and the person who uh, uh, was one of the best players in the country and won the tournament was 82 years old. But the important thing is the person who won the other tournament and is not, not only just here in the United States, but internationally, happens to be from Orlando. He's 22. So it is a real multi-generational sport. OK. So if we go to the bidding, going to Jackson's prior question, we would do this kind of an, an all in part type piece because I think we need to look at it. I think the motion would need to say that we want to understand the cost for one court, two courts to design. We would want Albert to work with the team to finish the design. And we want to know what is the run rate cost going forward so that we're understanding the full genesis of this project. Other questions from any board member? Any community questions or questions from the room? Let me know if there's anybody online. Patrick, please. I need you to come up with, so we can get your smiling face on TV. Oh, come on, Diane. <laughs> and this is Diane Finney again. She was up earlier. Yeah, 1230 race circle, uh, number 105. I just wondered, is this, um, I couldn't see the design back there, so this is my excuse. Uh, looks good, and I just wondered, could a person show up with their, you know, old um, croquet set? Or is this the uh, formal um, croquet weights and the, uh, the regulation mallets and balls and, and those uh, square wickets rather than the curved ones? I just wondered about what was the um, proper equipment. Uh, okay, let me answer that. Uh, certainly, you're welcome to bring your own equipment. Uh, there are, you would not probably want to use the quote competition type uh, uh, court. But uh, no one would have any difficulty using that, although we would encourage uh, to really get into the sport and to really understand it. Uh, I think the Croquet Association, from my understanding, has, has all the equipment that you need. And um, they're very anxious to, to, to get you in. And uh, from what I've heard them say, that they really feel very confident that 150 people would easily be playing croquet on those courts within about a year after they get uh, they get open. So uh, absolutely, you bring a mallet and a ball and I'm sure you'll be able to play. We can teach so, you. So we just, and we'll teach you. And, and just to be clear, items built with CROA dollars are amenities that are open to all CROA residents. We will, as we do this, um, Albert, want to make sure that we're getting cameras back there so that if somebody does something bad at two in the morning. We got very good pictures. Um, so we want to make sure we're doing that. But having discussed this, can I get a motion? Uh, 
<laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the, des the design as shown here, the design concept, and proceed with obtaining bids for both alternatives, one and two courts at Heritage Hall. Second. Okay, any additional board comment? Do, do we have a time frame on when we would have some of these estimates and, and what the what the going forward timeline looks like. Well, as far as my role in this, <clears throat> I would say within the next month we should have final drawings and numbers. And we would then bid that out to this kind of I mean there's some physical construction of the pavilions, but it, how do you how do you install these fields? Is this like when we had to go out and get a, a, a contractor to install the, the fields at the complex, or is it, a, is this a, a Yellowstone kind of installation? I mean, how does that happen? Um, so what we need is somebody with experience building athletic fields. So simply put, it's a matter of a laser leveling, providing the correct drainage, setting up so maintenance is you know planned. So we do have to go get a contractor who does that yeah, kind of work. Yeah. Okay. Plus we're going to have defenses and everything. I mean, we want it right. okay. done right. Okay. Um, and and during that period of time, when we get those bids back and we bring those bids before the board, um, I presume we're going to hear from the community. We're going to hear from. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear from people on um, uh, Begonia. Um, <clears throat> And so there will there will be other opportunities to visit this idea and see if how it works and how it fits in and make it adaptation if necessary. Am I correct about yeah, that? Yeah, tr traditionally that's what we would do. We develop the plans a little further, give the community an opportunity to review those plans and give feedback. Okay. Yeah. There's there's a question in the back. Yeah, well, there's a question online too, which okay. is what Sorry, is the second right. alternative for the motion online? The second, it's really itemizing the cost of one court versus two court when we talk about alternative one versus alternative two. Dave Eastland had asked online a question, and please come on up. There's one more question before that. Too. Uh, and the aren't lawn dirt a possible liability? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the answer is sure. throw it at somebody, sure. But I mean, <laughs> we have liability protections. I mean, lawn darts would not be a sponsored sport. You could go to any one. So we're not sponsoring lawn darts here. Um, this is croquet and stuff like that. If somebody brings lawn darts to any of our courts right now in place, they can play and they're assuming their own liability. So this is, lawn darts would not be our sponsored thing. Go ahead, please. Amber Strasburger, 611 Campus. Okay. A uh, question for the board, just things to consider as a concerned member of the community. Uh, we're talking about initial uh, startup costs or construction costs for this. I don't think of all, there's several things to consider here. Uh, I imagine this is going to be a considerable cost to the community. Uh, but what concerns me is the future maintenance fee. So, so far, uh, I think my first meeting was on or about August of this year. And we said for pickleball, no incurred cost to the community uh, for maintenance, et cetera, once these uh, things are built. I think that's documented and recorded um, from that meeting. So my concern is what additional costs are we going to incur? We're already talking about cameras. So we're talking about the maintenance of technological equipment uh, potentially being recorded, which means a contractor, which means maintenance to the facilities. These are incurred costs for the community. Uh, so as of right now, nothing in, in addition is going to be taken, you know, uh, from our quarterly costs. However, we've already gone up from what, 240 to 267, somewhere around there? That's just ours. And I belong to TCCA. So we have three costs for our community, uh, most of which we do not receive support from the Corolla to maintain our community, which the entire community uses. Uh, let's go back to the 25th anniversary. Who paid for trash removal? Who paid for overtime for that area? So there's some additional things that some of us are, are very, very concerned about. And we're looking to bridge the gap and the support between all the different villages. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of your comments there, just on the ongoing maintenance, that is actually one of the things that we comment on a little earlier. We agree we need to price that because maintaining the field at a putting green level is not cheap. I, I'm not gonna argue with you at all. And you will take the rest of it into account when we go through with the estimate. 
Because I think really what Jackson was saying was we we get the design drawn, we get the bids and estimates, then we look at the total cost as a package. All right, I'll call the vote individually. Cindy. Yes. Jackson. Yeah. David. Yes. And I'm a yes. So with that, what we'd like to do, Albert, is have to work with task force management to complete the design and the drawings as we've laid out here so that we can go to get bids to put this together. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you for your time. We Thanks, appreciate Alan. it. Yeah, pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you, Albert. OK, so now we're going to go to the Civic Corridor. So let's get this drawing up. Um, can you blow that up somehow so people can see it? Um, we have had a ton of conversation on the sport, uh, pickleball and soccer, and lacrosse and other fields, stuff like that. Um, been a lot of interim meetings that have occurred. We had about a two and a half hour um, parts of recreation meeting that occurred a week ago or so. So what we have done here Let's go to the, the narrative page first, please. So what we're going to do, <laughs> can you blow that up? <laughs> so that Jackson can't hear and I can't see. Um, so, so I can see it easier. So, so what I've tried to do here is say, okay, here's where we're at and I want to explain how we got here. Um, we have talked about two options. We talked about an option of taking field one and field two on the, um, I got it here. I just was trying to blow up okay. people online and stuff like that. Okay. Um, field one and field two, and possibly have a pickleball on field one and putting turf on field two and part of field one. Or we talked about the option of putting pickleball on lot D and keeping um, field one and field two as is. A lot of feedback from the community about wanting to keep three fields on the other side. Um, a lot of feedback. What I found fascinating at the Recreation Committee meeting is the Recreation Committee all agreed on nothing. Um, I think Lee Moore would like to have two grass fields. John Trout would like to have um, pickleball and um, turf over there so you have turf full time or everybody would be happy to have three turf fields um, built right now. Um, having looked at th that and thought about it a lot, it just became okay. But Dave Eastman made an important comment during that. He, he said pickleball would actually prefer to be on lot D. Uh, when we looked at how we made pickleball and the field sports and everything fit on fields one and two, we ended up in a situation where we were needing to move sidewalks. Maybe we were going to have to build retaining walls. We were going to have to move electrical poles. And it became quite awesome. So, we as a board said, all right, let's just keep field one and field two in grass. Um, I'll, I'll have David and Jackson and Cindy speak here in a minute. We are not interested in putting turf on field one and field two. Um, I suspect that would cost 1.3, 1.4 million dollars in today's world, to be very honest with you. And we had some people in the room arguing that they wanted to keep them in grass. They didn't want turf, so we don't even have consensus there. But if we keep them in grass, then we go to lot D and we take lot D and we really convert it over. I'm going to show you the design and really we got two choices there that we want to talk about. I know there's a little bit on that. I really want to talk about that today and on January 26th, which is in two weeks at our board meeting, make the decision regarding um, going forward. So if you can take me to the drawing, please. OK, so here I'm trying to get the people online to see it. So OK, so to the right. Not a right, but so to the right, the very right, that white shaded building is the amenity building right now that includes like the bathrooms and concession stands and all that when you go out to the fields. And on the other side of that would be fields one, two, and three for soccer, lacrosse, flag football, and that. To the left of that building is the asphalt parking lot today. We are looking at two options. Do we put a, another expanded asphalt parking lot 
beside the one that exists now? Or do we put pickleball right beside that? What we would like to do is take the rest of that field and make it what is called pad ready. What pad ready, because right now you go out there, it's just grass and trees and sunken and everything like that. Pad ready means that you set it up so that it's flat, you've got good drainage going down a hill um, and everything. It could be, it would be planted in grass. It could be used for parking for big events and stuff like that. It could also be used for grass. It could be used for a flag football game. It could be used for lacrosse game or anything like that. Um, so this model, and let's go to the second picture again. So this is picture right here. Other way, sorry. That's the second one? Yeah. Okay, because right there you got the parking lot beside it and you've got um, pickleball more in the middle. It just shows you the two. So the difference really here, get up here. So the, the difference really becomes, if you think about the building, you got the building here, you got the asphalt, you put a, an additional asphalt here, so that you'd have 50 spaces, you'd have 49, you'd have about 100 spaces that are in app. And what I am told from all the conversations, I don't have any young kids here, is that when you get into soccer mornings and stuff like that, you've got people dropping things up, a little bit of a zoo. You'd have pickleball here. The reason pickleball is going here is this is not broad enough down here to house pickleball. So literally, when you get to the rest of field D, it gets thinner as it goes along. So what happens is really that needs to be parking. We have events out there where we have 200, 250 cars parking. So when you talk about this space with it, like this one here, it's 160 spaces. If you went forward one, I'm sure you'd have more grass pay. You'd have pickleball over here. And the question was, do you go with more? I'm talking really more grass solution for parking, or do you have a bigger asphalt area here? This is really the model we're looking at with the other two, or the three, the turf fields, the two grass fields, as is, no change. We can look at the grass a little, just see if we can um, do something easy with them, but that's what we're talking. And then how we go with this side, that is what we're doing. And before I go to public comments, Jackson, Cindy, or David, do you have comments? You know, I've been the liaison to the Recreation Committee for four years. And I said at the last meeting that I've tried to be an honest advocate for what that committee wants to do to recognize their role in this process and to make sure that their voices have been heard. We have talked and debated and discussed that committee has gone through enormous amount of work. They have worked with the pickleball task force. Um, and last week, as we as they pulled the room, there was not consensus. After two years, uh, there was still significant, perfectly valid reasons for doing different things. At, at the at the close of all of this, the elected board has to make a decision. It's our decision to make. We're the ones that stand accountable for the use of dollars, as you pointed out, and how we spend them and how we allocate them and how we maintain them. It appears to me that finally, after two years, we've acknowledged that pickleball is a reality and it is going to happen. And we seem to have settled on the size of courts that is not what everybody wanted, but something for some, for everyone, at least enough to get us out there. Um, <clears throat> that's a long way from where we were a couple of years ago when we weren't even sure if we were gonna be able to do pickleball. And so I'm, I'm encouraged that we've done that. We have looked at, I don't know, Dory, six, seven different possibilities for how to do this. We've looked at different locations. We have looked at various costs and we have had a lot of input from a lot of very talented and very well-intentioned people. Having said all of that, we tried to come up with a compromise that would have allowed us to turf 
some of those grass fields because we thought that that was in the best interest of playability. When we heard from the users of those fields that they would prefer that they remain uh, unencumbered and the pickleball not go on those fields, even in exchange for turfing, um, I think it made it clearer that this proposal that you see of putting pickleball on lot D becomes the best of the options that we have. And then I think the question ultimately is, do you put it in between two parking lots uh, in effect, or do you, do you slide it up next to the existing one? As I've listened to the discussion and I've read the reports from KPM and I've looked at the, the different comments, it strikes me that this proposal with asphalt parking and then a piece of parking next to it to extend that parking, then pickleball, then making the rest of the lot pad ready for wherever we go. And basketball is something I would very much like to see at some point. Uh, but this makes the most sense to me. And that's the design that I would like to have bid out, uh, along with some information about what it would cost to AstroTurf uh, Fields 1 and 2 in their present configuration. I, I will also say that I recognize that there are lots of people in this community that think that somehow we are shortchanging our children. Uh, that because we're doing pickleball, uh, we're somehow taking away something from somebody else. I've called that amenity insecurity. I was opposed to turning over one of the fields unless we got something for it. We're not going to turn over the fields. You're still going to have the fields. You're still going to be able to play them. And we need to get them better drained and we need to be able to use them more. But we're not taking away anything. We have given a $4.5 million facility for this entire community, for children through adults. And now we're saying, let's do something for pickleball and then let's move on to the next priorities that we have. And so finally, the point comes when you have to make a decision and you have to say we're going forward. And I very much appreciate your leadership on this, Brian. I know you've taken a lot of heat for trying to push this forward, but I think that we are now at the point to make that decision. And so my vote tonight will be for that particular plan. Um, and, and I will look forward to the reports and the design bill to see how affordable this is uh, and what it will cost us to maintain it. And just so you know, as part of the charter revision, we required that any kind of capital construction has a, an attached run rate uh, that comes with it. So the whole community will know before we make the decision what it costs to maintain it. Um, so that, that's where I am tonight. And that, that actually was just Back there. That was actually a change with charter revision in 2020 that we have to make the run rate as something to you want to permit. But um, so okay. Cindy comments. Uh, Jackson mentioned still getting a bid on putting turf on one of the second field. I don't know that that necessarily that, that necessary that we spend the money if we're really not leaning. I, yeah, our I proposal know. was grass on one and two. It was not a turf on field two, definitely not. But did you just say, what did you Personally, do? I would like to know what it costs. You've given us a ballpark estimate. I don't think it would cost us very much to ask the engineers what it would cost to ask for turf. We can ask for a ballpark estimate. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we need to spend money to do that, but you know, uh, put else aside. I like this plan. Um, and, you know, Jackson's right. This has been uh, tossed around for at least two years, maybe more. And, and, you know, some people have the impression that we're trying to push this through. I think what we're just trying to do is after all these years, because, you know, everybody comes up with, you know, oh, this is a great idea. And then before you know it, a couple of weeks later, says, well, have we thought about this? And it never comes, it never comes to fruition. So, um, I think it's time, you know, that we make a decision, decide, you know, what we're going to do, make a decision, move on, and then move on to the next project. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. David, comments? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. And again, I also thank you, Brian, for your leadership and 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 moving this forward. Um, it's, it sounds like we're moving towards a proposal or a um, a motion tonight. 
that's what it sounds like. Um, and I think what you put forward on the screen where, where we, we have the existing asphalt lot, then we have an additional lot, then we have pickleball, then we have the remaining space. Um, and, and part of what we learned when we met with the engineers is the pickleball with the design could not be in that remaining space next to the CCDD building because it narrows there. It just wouldn't fit. So it seems like that's the reasonable place to go. Um, and leaving uh, fields one and two with the uh, natural or the grass fields. Um, pickleball was the priority more than two years ago. I think Cindy uh, talks about it e even going back. But when we had the, the formal um, a pro a scientifically appropriate um, a community assessment a few years ago with Lowe's design, uh, pickleball came out. Um, as a as a very doable item, uh, the, the top items, of course, just to remind all of us, it was the community center, uh, adult center, senior center, uh, performing arts, and because those were three or four different of the top items all clustered. Uh, so we again, it's a matter of saving money for that, um, and we you know we have, we also as a board previously agreed, and this came out of the that report from a couple of years ago. We previously agreed that. If something already existed, we wouldn't spend money on it. We would look for something that did not exist. Uh, so, you know, whether it's uh, uh, doing something more for the uh, 4.5, 4.7 million dollars that we put in, which was initially three, uh, 2.9 million uh, that the board authorized four years ago. Um, so, what we had agreed to is we would go for something new. So, something new is pickleball. And so I think it's time to move forward on that. And then as Cindy said, then look at the other projects. So moving, yeah, I guess it's moving towards a design build or or whatever the next stage. Let's move it forward because because then there's the uh, the pieces of getting permits and, and estimates and then signing off on at various stages. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple of public comments. We'll start with you and then there's one online that I'll read. Amber Strasberger, 611 Campus Street. Um, most of what I've seen and heard is mainly on Facebook or just by getting out into the community and speaking with other individuals. I don't think people are really opposed to pickleball per se or other amenities um, that folks would like to see in the community. I think uh, one is the cost. Um, I've heard some concerning things this evening. I don't know if uh, anyone else has picked up on that this evening. Um, $7,000 in uh, uh, salaries that weren't anticipated, although that's a very small a chunk of change as opposed to the big budget that we have. We're a couple of months behind in accounting. Granted, you inherited this. This is not something you know that's Green Manor's fault, but there are potential for uh, anomalies and potential for forensic accounting. I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking worst case scenario here. There's potential for hiccup along the way, things that we did not necessarily anticipate. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Th there are just things that I don't think are being thought through. Um, I did my seven o'clock walk this morning uh, down Main Street near the golf course, and I can tell you that area is it's not attractive. Um, my husband and I have been owners since April of last year, so almost a year, and uh, we've seen a steady decline um, in the appearance of this area since we've owned, and we looked in this area for two years before we purchased. So it's not a decision that we took lightly. It's not an overnight decision that we made to be a part of this community. But there has been a steady decline in the appearance of the community since uh, we've been here um, as homeowners. So it's just something to, to consider. Um, again, we don't mind additional amenities, but let's please consider taking care of what we have. Again, Grand Manor inherited this issue, um, but that's something that should not be taken off the table. Okay, let me answer a couple of your questions there. Um, we, we have three pots of cash. We have the operating pot, mm -hmm. we have a capital improvements pot, and we have a replacement reserve pot. Uh, each one separately funded. We absolutely agree, and it's actually later on the agenda here, that we need to fix a lot of things up coming out of the COVID world and everything else. Um, we have the funds to do that, and we're going to do it. And we're building a whole inventory process, and Lauren and I talk about that a lot. So we understand that. And some things, I'm not sure what areas you're talking about. Some things are CDD, some things are CROA, and we're focused on the CROA areas. The $7,000, while it's over, I really consider extremely small for what we have is a million and a half or so of expenses on salary. So I thought that was actually a very successful number. 
Um, we'll look, when we look at building out the amenities and stuff like that, we, I mean, I've heard the stories like, there's a question here online about, um, have we talked to the golf course before we put something out on the um, pickleball out there? Pickleball may be louder than tennis, but the reason for the Civic, and I'm answering her questions too along with that, the reason for putting stuff on the Civic Corridor, it is the best place right there by 417 and that for the noise. Um, pickleball is louder, beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's why we never, we actually considered, would you put it at a Heritage Hall or somewhere like that? And because of the noise, we said no. We actually think out there is the right place to do it. From a golfer, I play golf all the time. They won't notice it. So I, I feel pretty comfortable from that perspective. There's also a comment in here that Tampa has 1.5 courts per 20,000 residents and Seattle has three courts per 20,000 residents. Why do we have eight? We have, we wish spent a lot of time studying this. We have four courts today, none of which are adequate sized in anything and they're full constantly. I have, I get my ears bent a lot by people all around town who are wanting to play pickleball. For example, the Pickleball Association here in town is teaching beginners courses. And there was one earlier this week that had like 24 people just there for beginners pickleball. Pickleball, I, I have zero doubt, and I think the speak for the rest of the board has zero doubt that keeping eight courts busy will be pretty easy. So, and that's what I'm speaking to there and kind of answering this other question. There was thoughts around 12 or 14 and stuff like that. We scaled that back, but I, I, I feel very comfortable that eight courts would be kept busy just with residents only playing. I mean, especially when you add on Island Village, we'll be at 15, 20,000 residents full time plus snowboards and that type of stuff. From an expense standpoint, we will itemize everything, including run rate going forward so that you can see the component pieces. One last question. If there are incurred costs that exceed a certain budget, we have, uh, I think, local <laughs> representation here that may be able to answer the question, but transferring funds from one uh, expenditure to another or one pot to another pot, uh, is that against any rules? Replacement, I'll, I'll start it and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Replacement reserves by law uh, under 720 and our mm -hmm. charter, must stay in replacement reserve. So when we talk about our funds for fixing up this building, fixing benches, pools, et cetera, those are untouchable. From the perspective of the capital improvements funds, we in the charter review have actually combined that in the contingency and above $250,000, uh, the board can approve capital improvement things. We do have the ability to move those over to operating funds if the board should so decide. If we have capital improvement funds that would take that below 250, the board has to discuss it in public. Um, and, and that would not be our intention. I, I'll, I'll say that from my thoughts and the board will follow up there. But yes, we, we do have that flexibility to move funds except from replacement reserves, which I think is very smart not to be able to move from. Tom, did I say that correctly? Oh uh, yeah, I would just add the only time you can move replacement reserves from one purpose or another is with a membership vote. So the members would have to approve that. I did not know that even you can do that with a member vote. Okay, good. Yes. So are you looking for some sort of a action tonight? If um, I had said the 26th, but I mean, if everybody's on the same page, it just makes the process move. If you want to make a motion, I'll take the motion. Are there other public comments before we take a motion? I'm looking online and anybody in the room with a public comment. Diane? You don't have to say your name and address. Okay. Three minutes. <laughs> um, as you know, I enjoy tennis and I intend to continue to play tennis until my knees or something gives out. But pickleball, from, I, I went to a beginner's class and uh, it's interesting and it is noisy, but it is a growing sport. Um, and that's all I want to say is that I think you'd be probably providing a, a need for a lot of um, celebration residents that are getting older and it, it sounds exciting and probably make our um, community that much more appealing to future residents also. It's actually, pickleball is actually marketed by a lot of communities as something that keeps the value of the homes up to attract people. So I actually think 
building some of these amenities helps the value of all homes in celebration. I, I truly believe that. All right, Jackson, you want to make a motion? Um, I do. I'm just not sure quite how to phrase it. Our, I think my motion is to move forward with a design build bid concept from KPM. Uh, KPM Franklin. KPM Franklin uh, for lot D having pickleball by the parking lot and the rest of lot D being pad ready. So just to be clear here, to have the existing parking lot, a new parking lot, pickleball, and then the rest pad ready. That's correct. Okay, so I did, but that's yeah. I, so I don't know if I can the parking lot. Then we're doing pickleball, and then the rest pad ready. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Any last board comments, David? I'll third it. Okay, we got a third. <laughs> I'm going to call the vote individually. David, yes or no? Yes. Jackson. Yes. Cindy. Yes. And Brian is a yes. So what I'm going to ask. Lauren, is that the Pickleball Task Force, person or two are here, Steve online and that, and work with KPM Martin and management to bring us forward with this design, with the idea of getting, now we're going to spend some money here just so everybody's perfectly clear here and the board was aware of this. Now we go into they make a design ready thing, which means it does all the surveys, it does all the appropriate work and everything to have it ready to go to the county for permitting and for bids. So, um, we're ready to proceed. Um, Brian, just one other comment. What will be helpful, I know this is some part of a bid, but in, in working with KPM, uh, Franklin, what is the overall timeline with what you just said, you know, getting county permits and so forth? Because at the end of all of that, then we go to bid for a builder or a contractor. Is that correct? Yeah, the feedback I got was once we yelled charge that the design process easily takes two two and a half three months because yeah. it's 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 exhaustive work you got to look at all the plumbing all the electrical all right. the draining everything and we'll jackson didn't say it in his bid but we want component bidding so that we know the component piece bids and stuff that goes with right. It. right right if you put in light if you put in lights there what's the add-on cost if you put in a shade structure what's the add-on cost right all right from a board perspective I'll ask a question. We are now at 10 to late. How late do you want to go? Um, we have the amenity. Eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then I'm going to do this. I'm going to refuse to let Lauren speak. Um, what we have an amenities inventory in here. At the 26th meeting, we'll spend more time on it. We have talked a few times. We really fully understand. We hear it a lot. People think the board is not on social media. The board watches social media, but we don't get drug into social media because it's a never ending cycle. Myself, if I respond to something, people are going to say the crawl president said. I just can't go down that path. We have asked Susanna, we got Brian in the back row in there to look at everything. We have graded things. We got the grades in here where we started. We've graded a lot of stuff poor. We get it. We understand. We have charged management with getting things fixed up to CROA standards. Susanna and I have had that conversation. Lauren and I have had that conversation. Everybody knows it. We'll make more time for this on 26, but we got it. From a legal issues briefing perspective, Jackson and Tom, can you run us through that crisply? Yeah, crisply. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we have been talking with the CCDD about our Charleston service area. There was a question about a quit claim deed in changing those properties uh, back to the service area. We met with the executive committee of the service area and they um, uh, unanimously recommended that we not accept that quit claim, that there was no reason to do that. And so based on that, my recommendation to the board is that we uh, <clears throat> honor their wishes and we communicate to the CCDD that we will not be engaging in those discussions and uh, we would uh, appreciate and we appreciate that they have been working on this, but it's not something we're going to do. So, so basically yeah. it's business as usual on this particular item. Nothing changes. That's correct. Next item. Second thing is that um, <clears throat> we have uh, been engaged in 
covenants violations with one of the condominium units uh, here. You see it on the agenda. It's the Sienna, the master and the sub. And Sienna is an unusually designed condominium with a master association. <clears throat> Tom has been in touch with um, the attorney for Sienna. And um, we are now in what's called pre-suit mediation. Um, do you want to quickly explain that? Sure. So when you have a dispute, whether it's with an individual homeowner or with a condominium association regarding maintenance, repair, changes to the property, um, before you would ever go to court, you're required to offer pre-suit mediation. So we did that. We gave them an opportunity to agree to mediate. We gave them a list of mediators. Uh, I got emails from the attorney for um, Sienna, all the um, different associations last week and this week, and they've agreed to mediate. So the next step is to schedule mediation. That mediation needs to happen uh, no later than 70 days from Monday. And, and I would say to the board and to the community, we are taking these violations seriously. We are acting under the color of law as quickly as we can. I know some people would like us to have moved faster. The law doesn't allow us to move faster. This is the same process we have to go through with any covenants violation. We're doing that um, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to do what we can. I, I'm hopeful that there will be a cooperative spirit uh, in order to resolve these problems. And uh, that's the approach we're going to take. But if we have to go to litigation, we have to. Right, but hopefully we can avoid that yeah. with uh, yeah. mediation uh, settlement. So that's that's a informational piece. I, the, and I just want to add a comment. Because I think <clears throat> people of Sienna to hear it. I, I yeah. have no patience for letting this drag out yeah. for ever. I mean, I, I'm, I'm out of patience. Yeah, that'll be one board member's vote. <laughs> um, the third item we do need to make an action item. Um, as you may be aware, we have <clears throat> the way that we pay for capital improvements. <clears throat> is through an apartment recreational fee, among other things. And <clears throat> every commercial apartment landlord is required to pay a fee every quarter um, for the number of units uh, that they have certificates of occupancy for. Two of those landlords have not paid uh, in 2021. And we have now we're into the first quarter of 2022 and we are still awaiting payments. Therefore, I'd like to make the following motion, and it's very specifically worded because of the legality of it. So I'm just going to read it. I move to deny access to Croa's recreational property by residents and guests of Astoria DST 688 Celebration Boulevard and BRP Celebration LLC 1370 Celebration Boulevard, <coughs> effective February 1st, 2022. And for so long as assessments levied against these properties under the Declaration of Recreational Easements and Covenant to Share Costs as amended remain delinquent. And just to be clear to the audience, both online and here, we are being very careful about how we identify these properties, just as we would be careful about identifying any delinquency that would come from any property. So that is my motion. I need a second. And uh, Sandy is the second. Uh, or comment, David? Yeah, Jackson, I, I like the wording of it, but I have a question on it. Because when you said denied access to recreational property, yeah, uh, part of the recreation fees, as I understand it, also goes for uh, the coverage of the events that we offer. So can we also, is it legal and appropriate to deny access, not just to recreational property, but to CROA sponsored events? Yes, when, like, when an ID, like, like an ID is required when we go to whatever event we have. Yes. Would no, that be I, an appropriate would that be an appropriate modification to your motion, Jackson? Sure, I'd, I'd be willing to amend the, the motion. <clears throat> if you well, I'm just I don't know how you would police that because if they just have to show an ID, you don't know where they live. You know, it's not like we're going to go and take collect their IDs and cut them up. So I don't think you could, I understand what he's saying and that's, you know, we probably should, but there's really no way to enforce that. Well, let me explain the two things are gonna happen here. One is that we have filed an intent to foreclose. Um, am I correct or we're about to? We're about to. We're about to. That is the legal equivalent. I'm not 
offering legal advice here, but I think it's the legal equivalent of the nuclear bomb. Um, it should get their attention. But we also felt like it was important to acknowledge to the residents of those two complexes that they risked losing their CROA rights, whether we can enforce it or not, not for me to say. I mean, I, I don't know. But we have that obligation. Um, I think, you know, to the to the resident comment about how money is being spent. Well, when people don't pay their bills, that, that's an issue. So we are taking the responsible position here, I think, to say we are going to do everything we can to assure that these funds are collected. So you're right. I don't know that we can. Well, we can, we can turn off the cards so they can't access the pools and things. Yeah. yeah. From and here. The dog park. And, and the dog park. Yes. And the dog park. And the dog park, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are things you need your card to get into. So to, right. if we have and that in the motion, we can try. You can turn those off. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you can turn so do you want to amend your motion? Yeah, I'll amend my motion to add after uh, access to recreational property and CROA events. Want to second that? Sure. Okay. I'll call the vote. David? Yes or yes. no? Yes. I'm a yes. Cindy? Yes. Jackson? Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay. CROA board elections. Why don't you give us an update, Lauren? All right. So we have nine candidates at this time. Uh, I don't know if the generally we should say the names. That's been published. We don't have to say the okay. names. It's been published. So Every, everybody in town is reading it and talking I'm, about it. I'm sure. So election timeline moving forward. Uh, I will be meeting with the candidates to give them kind of an overview of board duties, responsibilities, the time that it takes to be a board member. Etc. A little bit about Tan Manners or Grand Manners and Town Hall staff, and that's happening uh, Thursday and Friday of this week. Uh, the candidate forum will be held on January 24th at 6 p.m. here in Town Hall. The the plan moving forward is each candidate will get two minutes up front and two minutes on at the end to introduce themselves and closing comments. We will have about five or six questions that we are hoping to get resident input on. Uh, to send it the, to the town hall Sierra mail. Uh, we will take the top five kind of most common <laughs> substantive questions to ask each of the candidates and they'll have a, a set time frame to answer those. Uh, ballots will be mailed out on January 27th. The polls will open on January 31st. Uh, March 1st, the polls will close. March 2nd is the annual meeting. And March 4th is your board organizational meeting. So on March 1st, do we have the team in place and everything to do the county or we're, do we still have work to do there? We still have work to do there and to find a moderator for the uh, okay. forum. We're working on it. Okay. Can I ask, because in the past, there's we've had as many as three forums because we have one on a Tuesday, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday in case somebody had you know, commitments or whatever. Um, but I see you're only going to have one. Have you have you cleared the date with the nine candidates? I mean, are you going to get a uh, a good sampling of the people that are running? Do you have any idea who's if everyone can make it? Or I will. We have. It's not a hard set date. I once I'm meeting with all the candidates in these next few days. That's why I wanted to get the candidate meetings uh, front and early. So if we needed to change that date because somebody had a hard uh, hard conflict, then. We'll will modify it, but our aim is for that January 4th, 24th date, so. And the answer is we tried to purposefully avoid the past process. Mm -hmm. We found that it did not work. Mm -hmm. People were voting before we even did candidate. Well, yeah, so. that, but that has to do with the date. So the date helps because that's yes. before yeah. everybody gets their ballots. But the thought behind having the multiple ones was in case somebody was out of town or on vacation or you know something that they would still have an opportunity. It will be in person and via Teams. So if somebody's out of town, then we can accommodate that way as well. Okay, okay so everything's in good shape. Yes. And the board still has to have a conversation around, well, I don't know if the board does, but management needs to figure out the annual meeting. I sent them a, a thing around today. And I think we ought to, my personal belief is, is that we ought to, you know, we've done, the appetizers, we've done the wine, we've had a festive thing before. I think we ought to try to do it again this year. And I, I personally, people in the audience can click me like I'm nuts, but I think people like getting together socially and we can 
want to wear your mask, pull your mask down, take a drink, and then talk to people. But I think it makes it more an event. It's much, it's much more fun having a board meeting when you can look at the audience. It's much more fun having an annual meeting when you can look at the audience. So if somebody wants to scream in the audience or scream online, please do so. But I'm a strong proponent of let's do the wine, let's do the appetizers, and let's make it a fun event for the evening. It, it's been a weird year, and I think we should do that. Okay. Um, anything else on the election, or are we good? One quick item that I need to cover in regards to Lot D. Um, Jackson and I, with Lauren and Susanna, out there, as we're talking about beautifying Lot D, you may have noticed the semis, you may have noticed the dumpsters and all that other lovely stuff. And some of us are, some of us other people, so we said we got to fix this problem. So we are working with the CCD right now on developing an agreement where we can take the land on Lot D, maybe 125 feet or so, right beside the CDD building, actually put in hedges and everything, and have a place to hide everything so that we actually beautify Lot D. So we're working on that. We wanted people to be aware we're doing it, but we need to cure the blight and just not like so. Um, that's what we're doing and working on. And we told we told CDD at their commissioners meeting, and that that is underway. So wanted everybody to be aware. Any oh number seven motion to approve a new ARC number. We need to do that. One. Yeah. So I'm not sure how we're identifying this. Um, I would make a motion to approve the first uh, application in our board pack. Uh, of that applicant. Um, I appreciate we have two applicants here. We only have one spot. Um, and I appreciate that both are willing to serve. Uh, but I do think that uh, applicant A has some relevant uh, architectural experience. And so I would move to approve that number. Is there perfect clarity on who we're talking about from your perspective? Yes. Can I get a second to that? I will please? second that. Any board comment? Can I call the vote? David? <laughs> I'm a yes. I, I, I'm a yes. I agree with what Jackson said. I'm a yes. Cindy. Yes. Jackson. Yes. Passes unanimously. Okay. So to close, any co closing board comments for tonight? David, any closing comments? Yeah, two comments. One, um, I appreciate having teams, and so I can be here. Uh, it only got hiccups a couple of times where it stalled. Um, but it came right back. So I appreciate uh, Jim Hayes and the technology committee's work. Did just fall. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did it just? What happened? It just stalled. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it, wow. it, did it stall while I was talking about it stalling? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> overall it worked well, so thank you. Uh, second is, uh, you know, we're approaching. Brian, you referenced this earlier. The transition, you know. To, to a new management company that was November 1st. We also had a new board policy in terms of inspections where we put into the contract uh, quarterly inspections of all homes and then a new covenants process with a timeline that I think took effect January 1st. So what I think would be helpful in February is to get an accounting of that. How is that all going? Uh, how is that process? I know it'll be early from a covenants perspective, but overall, how are the inspections going? Because a lot was let go over the last couple of years. And so we're playing some catch up and that's why we put into the scope of work. Okay, I think what you said was covenants inspection. Let's see if we can get a report or something like that for the next meeting that at least we can know how it's going. Well, and you're gonna talk in the 26th meeting about a little more in depth on how you want covenants to to run yeah perfect we'll make that part of it jackson board comments thank you thank you, thank you david um just just a quick comment i want to thank the nine people who are putting their names in to be candidates for the board um i like all of us that serve we do it because we love our community because we care uh and because we get you know the best seats in every restaurant um, but I, I am particularly appreciative that we have people who really want to, to serve, and I would invite all of those uh, candidates, regardless of their background, to reach out to us as board members, uh, that we would be glad to share our insights or lack thereof, 
um, our experience and what this is like. I can tell you that being a board member is incredibly gratifying, but it's also an incredible amount of work. There is the perception that this is a volunteer position. It's actually a volunteer unpaid job, and it takes far more effort and hours than most people recognize. I know you'll cover that uh, with, with the candidates, but I do hope that each of the candidates takes this process seriously uh, and prepares themselves as though they will be elected and able to join us on March 5th, uh, feet running and ready to hit the ground because we have a huge number of things that we're going to be dealing with. So um, that's my only comment tonight. <laughs> Nothing, nothing burning. Just glad to be glad to be seen and see folks. Good. All right. I want to thank the audience for being here. I want to thank a lot of. It's been a stressful seven, eight, nine months. We brought some closure to some things tonight. We're making good progress with Rand Matters. I do understand we're not perfect yet, but I do think the process of governing is working, and I thank everybody for involvement. And I ask you to please stay involved. It helps. Or the board, I said it earlier, the board does read social social media. The board does listen to our friends and our enemies. We, we figure out where the hot buttons issues are. And if you tell us, we don't know, we go elsewhere. Because there's a million people coming at us from a million different directions. So feedback matters. Thank you, everyone. Can I have I a Steve, Nor Steve Northridge here. I've been trying to make a, a brief, I have a hand raised. Can I make a comment? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, a couple of things. Steve Northridge, 1130 Tapestry Drive. Two things. So one is related to the teams. Um, the, uh, the way I'm using it must be deprecated interface because I have no ability to do chat or ability to see the drawings, whether they're being presented. I don't know if I'm on the web interface or the application, but it's deprecated. I've tried to every every like setting to try to change it. But that's just one thing. Maybe we could sort out what that is. I'm not sure how to fix that right now. The next thing is the, uh, the CDD comment about lot D. Um, I think some thought should be given to potentially moving that whole maintenance yard to some other location. CDD has other locations that they could potentially use, potentially behind the Celebration Point. They sold property to the Celebration Point community, but they retained part of it that's behind the CDD building. I think the use of the maintenance yard there is really incompatible with what you're trying to achieve. You have maintenance vehicles going up and down that road, and you have children that are going to be playing, playing in the sports and so forth. I think a long-term plan should be looking at trying to move the maintenance yard somewhere else rather than trying to extend it and add more things to it. Um, and also having CROA land given to CDD is I think going to be problematic uh, from a legal perspective. It's a short, it's a lease. It's not given away forever. And we have talked with CDD about finding another location and it's easier said than done. If we could find another location that worked for everybody, we would gladly do it. Well, the term of a lease, if it's, if it's one day, it's one thing. If it's, if it's a five year lease or a 10 year lease, that could be construed as effectively giving it up. So I, I think it'd be a tough, tough sell to try and say it's uh, just leasing is no problem. So I understand he's got a comment on it, but I, I understand. License. Uh, it's a license. It's a no, license with a, it's a license as opposed to a lease. So it's a little bit different and it has termination provisions to, uh, to end it early if necessary. What would be the duration of the license? Uh, I think the license is originally five years, but um, like with New Leaf, when we allowed them to use the property, um, there's termination provisions that are built into it to allow us to make a change if we need to. The answer is there's no good answer. We, we, we've we talked about it in spades. We do understand the challenge. Okay, and it's it. thank you. Motion to close this meeting. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Done. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much.